present our speakers tonight. We have Joe Shower and Kelsey Dieter. They're both with the regional accounting firm of Malda and Jenkins. Jay is in Albany and Kelsey works out of the Atlanta office. He is a CPA on the professional staff and she is the human resources manager for the firm. So they'll have several different things that they can tell us about. Um, both of them are graduates of Georgia Southwestern and they can uh, tell you a little more information when they get ready to speak. But we're really excited to have them. Jay is back by repeat performance. He was here I think in the spring of 2013 or something and it was really a good program and we thought well this been enough time passed that we could run, run something similar again. So welcome and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for having us. Um, love coming back and uh, giving back to the, to the alma mater. Um, I have a outline prepared. I can go through it or we can make this a discussion. Either way, it's going to be a lot easier on everybody if it's a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but that's completely up to you guys. Um, tell you a little about me. I was born in Bainbridge and migrated up here to go to school in 2003. Uh, and I still reside here, hell up, 49 North, um, commute back and forth to Albany daily. Graduated with my bachelor's in accounting in 06, MBA in 08, got my, I started with Martin Jenkins January 5th, 2009, got my CPA license in June 2012, CGMA November 14th. I'm an audit manager, um, I work on 23 audits and three reviews. Um, a makeup is 13 benefit plan audits, four agribusiness, a construction company, pharmaceutical retail company, two manufacturing companies, trucking company, heavy equipment retail company, and I do a review for a construction company, manufacturing company, and an engineering firm. So I'm really busy. Busy from January to April, and then again from June to um, about October 15th doing benefit plan stuff, because that's when they're um, audits have to be filed with their tax returns with extensions normally by October 15th. Um, do very small amount of just general various business and individual tax returns, not really heavy in the tax department. So I mainly focus on the test side of things. Um, I've also worked on financial institution audits, governmental audits, um, and then kind of outside of client work, I'm a mentor I was on the ES standardization committee, which is where we, group of managers got together and kind of standardized the way that our files look for the entrepreneurial services uh, niche. Uh, I was on the MJ LEAP committee uh, for two years. Last year was our first year and what LEAP is, it's a um, training conference during the summer. It's a week long. It's been in Augusta the past two years, or no, I'm sorry, Athens the past two years. We sent all the staff one and twos throughout the firm to that. So instead of sending staff one and twos to all of the different industry conferences and getting repetitive information. We just have one big conference for staff one and twos. Um, so I was on that for two years. I was also on the entrepreneurial services and benefit plan internal inspection team. So I do a lot when I'm not busy, still with the firm. Um, just some general information about Malden Jenkins. We have six offices, Atlanta, Macon, Albany, Georgia, Birmingham, Alabama, Chattanooga, Tennessee, right into Florida. So we're a pretty, pretty big regional firm. 45 partners, 280 employees. Um, and we got, I think, about 46 million in net fees. I think, or excuse me, yeah, net fees. Um, we service banks, governments, closely held businesses. Anything that's not one of those, we consider kind of entrepreneurial services. If you're an entrepreneur and you need a test work or tax, that's what we consider you. Um, and that's mainly what I do. Long-term health care, nonprofits, construction, benefit plans, individual business estate tax, manufacturing real estate, and information insurance. And a fun fact, we will celebrate our 100th year anniversary May 31st, 2018. Is that right? So we've been in business for 100 years. Wow. So that's, that's pretty strong. Um, so a couple of things that Carol and Susan asked me to talk about was you know, what we expect from you and what you might do as a new staff, um, kind of the makeup of the audit team, how teamwork flows into that and into the audit process. Um, some pointers for passing the exam and then Kelsey's gonna talk a little bit about um, the application process and job search and that type of thing. Figured she was a little bit more suited since she dealt with that a lot. 
Um, so, everybody ready? Anybody got any questions so far? No. All right. Um, okay, so what we expect from you. Maybe a cliche, Rome wasn't built in a day, neither will your career. It's going to take some experience and some knowledge to build up, to, to you know, progress through your career. You gain knowledge with the more experience, the more work you do. So that said, you will generally start out on simple business, individual property tax returns. Uh, you'll work your way up to more difficult returns um, in the, maybe the next year, maybe the year after. Just depends on how each person progresses. There isn't really a set track for, for any one person. Um, so that's tax-wise. So audit-wise, you'll mainly just do field work, which is the meat and taters of the audit, um, which will be, you, you'll work on low-risk audit areas, cash, accounts payable, fixed assets, crude expenses, and the income statement. It's relatively low risk. Um, it's not a whole lot of intense work that goes on, so it gives you guys a really good working knowledge of being able to tie the risk for the section to the work that you do um, and the procedures from the programs. Um, you may be asked to complete fairly simple compilations and reviews. This usually comes when you're doing tax returns. Um, you know, that we may do a tax return and a compilation for the same client, so you might do it all at the same time. Um, but don't worry, somebody looks over what you do. It's cool. You, <laughs> nothing goes out the door without somebody looking at it, um, which everybody still gets review points. I still get review points. Everybody gets review points. You're, it's just human nature. You're going you're gonna to miss something. Maybe small, maybe punctuation mark somewhere, but you're going to miss something. Um, questions? I have one, sure. and you're probably going to touch on it. Because, you know, I'm, I'm a little older coming into, I'm changing the career uh, field. Because I was in manufacturing for many, many years. And, you know, what advice do you have for someone in my position that's coming in a little older than, than most of my competition? Uh, <laughs> what's going what's to make me more marketable, you know, to a firm? Uh, are you are you seeking your CPA? You want to get your CPA license? Uh, well, I mean that's the point I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do I need to go? Um, what I would say you have going for you is experience. Okay. You have loads of. I don't know what you did at the manufacturing company, but yeah. but you yeah. you have loads of experience that your competition can does not have. So you got that. That's your selling point, in my opinion. Is your your experience in that field, along with your your education, how you do in, in school, and your personality? I do want to add though, we with a public accounting firm, we do require everyone to sit and eventually complete their CPA license. Mm -hmm. So that has to be a goal of everyone who wants to come work for most public accounting firms, and they complete it within two years of employment. And that's just something. So that that would be something that I should go ahead and add. You know, to my yeah. idea, that would kind of give me a little. I'm going to go over the recruiting process, and I'll touch on how most schools, how that process works. So. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll kind of go on to the audit team. So the audit team is generally a partner, a manager, and in charge, who can either be a supervisor, senior, or staff two, or and uh, a staff who can either be supervisor, senior, staff two, staff one. So most of my jobs, there's a partner, there's me, the manager, I also act as the in charge, and there's a staff anywhere from supervisor down to staff one. Um, I do have some jobs where I also have an in charge, and I don't have to be the in charge, there's an in charge and a staff. That works out really well because I can kind of sit back and focus on the high risk areas, um, and be more of a leader than um, than a worker be, I guess you would say. Um, so you've got lots of different people, lots of different backgrounds, lots of different personalities. So you have to be able to not only know what your personality is, but know what others are too, and know how to interact coherently with one another on the team. Because the better you do, the easier it is on the person above you, the easier it is on the person above them. And if that's not the case, 
let's say you, it's Friday afternoon, you've got one more section to do, you're on a job next week, and you kind of just blow through it and don't really put all into it that you need to. Well, the next week, in charge is also on another job, but he's reviewing your stuff. So he's either got to spend the time, he or she, has either got to spend the time reviewing your stuff and giving you review notes or reviewing it and fixing it, which is going to in turn decrease his production on the job that he's working on. And, you know, the job that you did on Friday afternoon might be fixed by the time it gets to, to that partner. But the job that he's working on that's he or she um, that's lacking may not be fixed by the time it gets to its partner. So everything kind of, if, if one person messes up, everybody messes up. I had a hitting coach when I was playing baseball in high school. One of his favorite words, or for his favorite terms was, if it's good at you, it's bad at you. Think about that. It, this is a, a field where it's really, really good for you to take ownership in your your good times and your bad and learn from your bad. So that's kind of how teamwork kind of wraps up in everything. I have a question. Sure. Do y'all use programs like engagement that Absolutely. would, okay. Mm -hmm. Cause I had an internship this summer and I've worked on a couple of 401k audits and engagement was really cool because if I did the first piece of it, then I could sign off on it and they knew who had actually done the work when they were reviewing. Absolutely. Yeah, that's actually the platform that we use for our okay. test work. Um, and it's, there, there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different platforms out there. Um, the, probably the two most common are engagement and, oh, uh, the other one just slid me. So I have no plug for the other company, sorry. Engagement. <laughs> <for that. laughs> um, but yes, and, and as far as I know, every, firm now uses some kind of electronic program. Uh, we are paperless. I don't really know any um, regional firms that aren't. I'm sure there are probably some small mom and pop shops that still have paper files and big binders that, that would work papers in them, but I, I think that's probably few and far between. Okay, so moving on, the audit process. So it's basically three stages. <coughs> Planning, field work, wrap up. Planning is usually left up to the in charge of the manager. It's where you go through the main the main um, portion of planning is spent doing your understanding of the entity and the environment in which it operates, documenting and testing internal controls, um, risk assessments on the major audit areas, and design your further audit procedures or your audit programs. So that's planning. Then you have field work, which like I said is the meat and taters where you actually go to the client's office, get their information, tick and tie, test, rec make sure cash reconciles, look at fixed asset additions, all that good stuff. Then you move on, right? End of the week, move on. Well, if you got stuff outstanding, we'd like you to, to um, and not just us, everybody, like you, you know, you have to be accountable for your work that you're assigned to um, and get that done. So then after that, there's wrap up. So this is where the files are viewed, it's cleaned up, review points are cleared if there are any, um, financial statements are drafted, checklists are completed. Checklists, a lot of them. Um, and then where necessary, a uh, second partner or third may have to, to review, depending on the type of client and um, the risk associated with that client. Question. So, pointers for the exam. Who wants to sit for the exam? Okay, more than I thought. That's great. Okay, so my main piece of advice for that, do it now while you're in study mode, while it's fresh, you're fresh out of school, you can, you can move right into studying for the exam and it'll be easier for you to pass. Um, I kind of took about six months off, eight months off between, or probably more than that actually, probably about 12 between the time I graduated with my master's and I started studying for the exam. Six months later I got married, so it was, do I study, do I work, or do I spend time with my wife? 
so it became a constant juggling act. So there, it took about 24 months for me to pass my exam. I had to pass one section twice because I'd lost the credits. So that is major, major piece of advice is do it as soon as you can. As soon as you're eligible to sit, get the study material. It doesn't have to be Becker. Becker's a good one, but I know they're expensive. There's great study guides out there that aren't as expensive as Becker. Um, and start as soon as you can. That's my main piece. Um, if you don't pass, don't get started. Don't get discouraged. Um, there's a 15 to 20 percent pass rate on the exam for the re for a reason. If you don't pass, don't get discouraged. Keep at it. it. Took me twice on tax and audit, three times to pass financial, two twice, twice on um, I said tax and audit, and four times on BEC. It was my Nemesis and BC didn't get along. So keep keep at it. You'll eventually get it. Um, and don't overlook the. I know Becker offers it. I don't know if anybody else does, but they offer a final review course. It's like an eight or ten hour cram course. I did mine up in Atlanta for the last two sections. And anywhere from about five to seven days, three to five days before you take the test, you go sit in that cram course for eight or ten hours. Um, it's mentally just draining, but it pumps all the information back through you that normally you're going to see. And it kind of gives you some good do's and don'ts, like for financial and cash flows. If you get to the end and your cash flow, that your, your change in cash doesn't tie to what they say cash is at the end of the year, that's only a point. Don't worry about it. Move on. That's just kind of one of the things that I learned while I was there. Um, there again, that's a personal thing. I, I've recommended it to people and they said they didn't feel like it was it was worth the money. I personally did. Um, and then the last thing is kind of touch back on um, doing it now while you're in school or fresh out of school is you already have study habits. You know what your study habits are, you know what works for you. That's the best thing is to find a study method that works for you, not what somebody else says is good or what you know, I did or Susan did or Carol did. You just you gotta find that study habit that works for you, stick with it, devote the time to it. Once you put into it, you'll get out of it. Um so that's it for that. I have a question. Sure. So uh on your successful times, what would you say was your study pattern? Oh man. Um <laughs> So in the, the material, there are there are lectures that you watch. There are um, flashcards. There are um, there's audio files, and there is multiple choice questions. Just huge test banks, thousands and thousands of questions from previous and current exams. Um, and there are simulations that you practice in simulations. So if I had to say the things that I focused on when I when I was passing, um, watch the I watched the lectures one time. When I first started out, first started studying, I watched a lecture. Maybe I didn't pick up everything, so I'd watch it again. And they're like, some of them are three and four hours long. So you, you kind of, it's kind of like school. I, I was a student that if I went to class and paid attention, I made good grades. So this was hard for me because I watched the lectures, I paid attention, but I didn't catch anything, I didn't make good grades. So I had to find my own study pattern. I, I had to build myself one. Um, so it was watch the lectures once, flashcards, audio files on my, on my iPod, back and forth to Albany to work, and just crush hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of multiple choice questions. And then don't forget the simulations. Don't crush, don't, don't leave out any one part. If you, if you leave out the simulations, they're going to bite you on the test. If you leave out the multiple choice, it's going to bite you on the test. Because even though you might understand and comprehend it while you're watching the lectures and doing the, the homework, um, it's hard to translate that to the multiple choice questions because there's not just one right answer. A lot of times it's pick the best answer. Um, so that's, and the, the last two that I passed, I took the final review on. And I, that was probably the probably most beneficial for me with those, for those two um, final reviews. 
So do you feel like you studied every waking minute, or was it a certain <laughs> number of hours a week? Well, well, like I say, it was it was a constant juggling act between work, study, and new life. Um, so, and when I was studying, I felt like I should be doing the other two, and, and vice versa. Um, so, what I tried to do was. I would study, I would listen to audio files back and forth to work, so that's, you know, hour and a half a day. I would try to do about anywhere between an hour and two hours at night, just depending on what time of the year it was and how motivated I was or, or not motivated or, um, and I would try to do it for four hours on Saturday and Sunday. That was kind of what I wound up doing. Um, and it came out to what, about 20 hours a week or so probably. Well, I know that last couple of years that I was at Malden Jenkins, and this is my eighth year here, so it's been a while. Um, there was my, my office was upstairs, and there were a good many young staff up there. And they, I would see, I was a morning person, and they would be there at 6:30 and 7 in the morning. They would say, well, they studied better when they were fresh in the morning, so they might get there at 6:30 or 7 and study until you know office hours really began at 8. That was very prevalent with that that group that was trying to um, get that done. But now Joe was spending his time commuting for right. so right. I would have liked to have done that. Kind of be the substitute for that. But they were there early, you know, before yeah. they got tired. And that goes so, back to what I was saying about finding a, a study method that works for you. If you're a morning person, get up at 5 a.m. and crush it for two hours and be at work at 8, then that's what you should do. Um, if you're not a morning person, if you you know, it just hate life in the mornings, and it takes you to about noon to get going, and you really start hitting on all late center cylinders about you know six o'clock. Study for study at night. Um, it, it really it, it depends on you, and that that kind of really goes back to you got to find the study method that works for you the best and fits your habits. Anybody else? The uh, the simulations you were talking about. What what? I mean, what does that consist of? Okay, so each portion has, um, each each of the four parts of the, the exam has a simulation. B, C is um, it's three essays, you write on two of them. No, yeah, no, three essays, you write on all three and they grade you on two. You don't know which two they're going to grade you. Um, so that one, even though it sounds pretty easy, um, it's kind of different. It's kind of difficult because, you know, they'll give you a topic, and if you don't necessarily know what the topic is, then you bog yourself down on and spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the topic is because there's also a research um, portion of the simulation. So there's somewhere where you can go and research the topic if you don't know about it. Um, what I learned in that final review class, and I don't know if it's still the case, is if you don't necessarily write on the topic they give you, but you can form a an opinion and stick with it and make sense and use correct grammar and correct punctuation, then you don't get counted off as much for not knowing the subject matter. Um, so that's a little tip. Uh, audit is the simulations on it are um, reconciling. I think there's a cash reconciliation. There's financial statement prep. I had to do a cash flow on, on one of mine. Um, there is on the assertions, you, there's some, some work on the assertions where you have an assertion and you have a, not a definition, but a, a real world example and you have to match which one goes with, which assertion goes with which example. Um, it's kind of general stuff like that. Tax, there's, um, you might have to fill out a 1040. It might give you some, some information for that. You might have to do deferred tax schedule. Um, stuff like that. And then, what am I leaving off? Financial? So each, each component has a simulation. Yeah. That's, that's specific to that, right. that portion. Where you're actually going to more or less simulate a real world right. situation. You, you've got to prove that you can, you can speak the right answers, pick the correct answer. And on simulations, you've got to show you, be able to, you can show you work. So if you're just a good multi choice test taker and you're able to pick out the right the right answer all the time, but maybe you don't, you're not as strong in simulations as kind of bite you. Yeah, that's where they check your articulation. Right. right. 
봐요. 봐요. Do you have a recommendation on whether to get your master's first or sit for CPA exam first? If I had it to do over, I would do it at the same time. Um, my dad tried and tried and tried to get me to sit for the exam while I was in my master's program. And it was, oh, Ted, I, I'm, I don't, I don't want to be a CPA. I don't want to do taxes all the time. That's, that's not what I want to do. Um, and lo and behold, um, ran into Kelsey at Floyd's one night, and she said, hey, are you looking for a job? And I I said, actually, I am. She said, okay, email me your resume. And within a week, she called me and said, hey, you got your interview set up. Um, so that, I'll touch on a little bit of hers since you never know where you might run into somebody. Um, <laughs> but going back to my answer, I regretted after I started MJ, I regretted not doing it while I was in my master's program. Um, you know, if normally, unless you're a, a truly traditional student and you're you're hard time in your master's program, you're not working. Most people are working while they're getting their masters. Um, I was, but it was a part time gig, so I had time to study and I had time to work on my my um, master's classes. But I also had some extra time that I could have spent taking the exam, um, and probably wouldn't have been as bad. Studying aspect of it, because I was still kind of in a group. I don't know. This is really a question, but some of the um, like, if you go and you get your master's of accountancy, mm -hmm. some of the last semesters they start trying to prepare you for the CPA exam too. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a couple programs around the state that actually have the the Becker course as some of their master classes. Right. Um, and so you go in there and you, you do the course and then you take the test and that's part of your, you get credit for it towards your master's for it. That's awesome. If you go, if you, you know, I'm not telling you to go to, to another school, <laughs> stay here at Southwestern, but if you do and you want to get your, your master's and you want to sit for the exam, I recommend going that route um, if you're not planning on staying here. Um, I feel like that's, it's a win-win. Um, you, you're getting your master's credit for it. You're getting your hours. You're 30 hours over, um, and you're getting your CPA exam all at one time. We offer bonuses for you know how quick you pass your exam after you start. Um, there, I didn't get it, but they're <laughs> they're really nice. Um, <laughs> I think the the last thing they offer is a. 18 months because you pass it within 18 months, am I right? Um, and I, I would like to think that all the other larger firms do that as well. Um, so there's some extra incentive for you to, to either pass it quick right after you start or even pass it before you start. And I'll tell you that during the interview process, if you've already got a couple sections passed or you're sitting or you're, you're done completely, that's a big, big plus. much time as you want. Right. Do we start talking about recruiting? Sure. Okay. Yeah, that's a good that's a good thing, right? So Kelsey, she's gonna talk a little bit about uh, job search, recruiting, application, yeah. all that good stuff. So I did graduate from Southwestern, I got the MBA. He is correct. All he had to do was listen. He made good grades. I probably rolled my eyes a few times. But um <laughs> but I graduated from here. My husband actually graduated from here. He's an actuary. So in talking about his um the study material we listened to I can't remember the man's name he does all the Becker videos oh um you'll become you'll feel helpful the real the, the real um the real uh, flamboyant guy yes so um, he does it Carlos Olano okay well he came name. to our firm he's got yep. guys and one thing he said is if we say that it takes 70 hours to pass the exam have a spreadsheet. It's, you should study 70 hours and you should feel comfortable enough to take the exam. I know my husband did that for all the actuarial exams and it worked. So that's one advice I would have. If they say that's how long it takes, it probably does take that long to be prepared for that exam. So I would just follow that guideline. Yeah, but, I don't think that you're going to start studying two weeks before you're going to sit <laughs> and that you're going to pass. If you're a really good test taker, then you might, but it's just not realistic. So I was just going to give a quick overview on how the recruiting process works for Malden and Jenkins are firms our size or larger. 
So just quickly think outside of GSW, which I did not until I graduated and got this job. Yeah. But um, so we alone in our HR department, we visit 30, we have 30 different uh, recruiting, I guess, events throughout the spring semester. And Alabama, we start in August. Hiring, we'll have, let's say there's 15 positions available, five of them will reserve for our Alabama students, meaning Auburn, Alabama, UAB, Stanford, Bliss, all the different, I guess, schools in that state. Then we go to Georgia. Georgia's next. Georgia's at the same time as Florida. So we will attend several Florida schools. We attend every school pretty much in Georgia. And from there, we'll say, okay, now we're going to reserve 10 of them. And if we find a student from Tennessee when we go to those schools or South Carolina, we might make an exception for a couple more positions. So that's, I just like to add that and just put in perspective that you're not competing with the people in this room, you're competing with, I'm pulling me hundreds of students, the stack of, I mean, I have a section in my file drawer of this many resumes. We do put you at the top if you pass the CPA exam. We put you at the top if you have good grades and you're active on campus. We're not real into the 3.5 or higher, but you've done nothing else. We do want to see you have some work experience, that um, you're involved on campus. I mean, it could be really anything you're doing. We like to see that. Um, I'm trying to think. We do want you to have a plan for the CPA exam. We're a CPA firm. You have to have your CPA license. After three years is when you will have extreme pressure on you to complete it or to move on. So one, one of the partners. Uh, put it real good to me when I was when I was studying for mine. He said, "The name on the on the building isn't Malden Jenkins Accountants. Malden <laughs> Jenkins Accountants. So you got to pass your exam." And CPAs typically are paid a little bit better than ones that are industry. I'm not saying you can't have a very successful career in industry. You can, but um, that's just reality. Out of school, our pay is very competitive. We pay between fifty and fifty-five thousand a year. I like that that too, because that is a lot starting out of school. And I guarantee you, Jay, or y'all could even, um, out of your friends, if you graduate and you start out making that kind of money, you're probably making more than all your other friends. It's just reality. Yeah. I started out marketing. Uh, I'm telling <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, in the end, like I said, we want to know what you're doing for your Mac um, or your MBA, whatever it might be. We want to know that, and we want to know what your plan is for the CP exam. Again, a lot of students, it is the truth, University of Georgia, Auburn University, Florida, University of Florida. It's built into their program, but y'all are just as competitive as them. So just let us know what your plan is. Again, it's not into the program. They're paying a lot for their tuition those semesters. They're paying for Becker on top of actual tuition. That So there is something to be said for starting it early, but it's not required. We offer internships in, okay, Atlanta, we offer internships in the spring and summer. In Albany, we offer internships in the spring and summer. Macon, we offer internships in the fall and spring. So I don't know where everyone's from, but that's how our internships work. They're very competitive. We fill up quickly. And like this year in our Albany office, we had a lot more full-time um, candidates than we had the internship candidates. So we hired more full-time just because they can stay, they can work longer. So we do hire, with that being said, a lot more full-time than we do interns. So if you don't get an internship with us, don't think that's it. It's just the way it works. Let's see, um, internships are paid. We do ask you to take time out of school to do it. We don't want you to go to school and to work. We want you to just work. And you'll work 40 plus hours a week. Again, you're paid for that time and a half, any time over the 40 hours. But um, now whether or not you take one or two classes, we don't know, we don't care. We just don't want you to have to leave at four o'clock every day because you have to get back to campus or whatever it might be. We want you to actually be there working. And if you have an inventory, I don't know. Or you happen to be out of town traveling on an audit job, you know, it just kind of doesn't work if you're yes. taking classes on campus. Draft and Tucker's the same way, but I can list several firms that do the same exact way we do it. So, and again, they're at all the recruiting events we're at. So we have a lot of students that can do that. They carve out time their senior year, spring semester. So we, we don't have trouble filling those positions. So if y'all are interested in a spring internship, I would say plan for it. But again, if it doesn't work out, I cannot do it, then um, consider us for full time. We do have a summer leadership program. It's in May. What? That's why. It's in July. <laughs> and um, I don't know where I got made from. It's in July. We haven't set the date, but it's two half days. It's typically in Athens. That's where our manager partner went to school. Y'all both know him. And um, so 
that's where we have it at. We invite students from all over the state, all over the southeast, from all the schools we visit. We try to pick out ones that we think would be a possible candidate for us. We'll hire, I mean, we'll invite about 50 people to that, so there is a lot of positions available. You can apply for our summer leadership program. It's really good to hear from all of our industry leaders, HR, and it's just a way for us to get to know you, and it is a lot of fun. Yes. Let's see. What am I leaving out for recruiting? Uh, what about getting your master's? Uh, how do you view getting a master's versus just having 150 hours versus MBA or Mac? Okay. Personally, I don't really care. I mean, we just, once you get your CPA license, everything just kind of floats off in the distance. We don't really care where you went to school. I mean, we do, but it's not that big a deal. We want you to have your CPA license to work for us, and that's what our clients want. For us, for you to keep moving up, obviously we're able to bill more of the client, and for liability reasons, you have to have your CPA license so we can say that, you know, they have the knowledge, they have the license, and they're equipped to do this job. So it is important, and that is why we do require it. But in the hiring process, would you, like, you got an MBA, but a lot of other people um, It really, and it depends where they go to school. If you are the overall package, you've been involved, you have good grades. I got the 150 because I was an engineer major and then decided to do accounting or HR and decided to do marketing, it doesn't matter. But along the way, you ended up with 150 hours. We are fine with that. We do not want you to go back to school, spend money to get your MAC or your MBA to fulfill those requirements. However, if you are the student that started, you knew you wanted to do accounting, you took principles, and you just loved it, then um, I would suggest if you still have those 30 hours complete or finish about 120, I would get your, I would get your MAC. That's just the honest truth because it does prepare you for the CPA exam. But the MBA is fine. We have a lot of candidates that come in with just their MBA, and we're, I mean, they're just, Jay is very, he's done extremely well at our firm. Uh, our partner in charge of our Albany office <laughs> says that he is the, um, he's definitely set a good example for George Southwestern. So, you know, it just doesn't matter. It's the person and how quickly they're ready to pass the exam. I keep saying that because that really is important with us. Absolutely. Oh, well, I, I was actually thinking on, trying to get a bachelor's of science as well along with my uh, BA in account and get a bachelor's of science in information technology with a business coach. So I would, you know, those hours go toward that. I mean, would that, would that make a difference in somebody in like your position? Well, okay, so you have to have the 150 hours, yes. You have to have 30 hours in upper level accounting courses. Mm -hmm. So whatever qualifies for you to sit for the exam and become licensed is what we care about. Okay. There'll be ones that want to do HR, they want to add on all these different things because they think it will help their career. I'm not saying it would not. But um, but for us, we just really want you to be able to sit for the exam and get it yeah. completed. And that's just the truth. Okay. That's why I asked. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I think what the, uh, a situation where you're talking about if you're getting if you're dual majoring basically mm -hmm. in accounting and information science, is that right? Well, information it's, technology. It's information technology. Okay. Um, if you're dual majoring that, I would venture to guess that you're probably eligible to sit for the exam when you get um, when you graduate. It's not your because you've got 150 and you probably got 30 over. Um, and if not, then you might need one or two more classes in accounting or something. I think it would. I think it would put me over as far as upper level, not necessarily accounting class, but over the uh, upper level class to put me over the 150 threshold. And Becker, if you do take them, um, they'll allow you to have get some credits through their program. It is more expensive for firms our size, again larger. If you were to take a spring internship with us, which would be typically from January through April 15th. We will, um, and you were extended a full time offer after that time, we would pay for Becker. So, or we'll pay for any CPA review material. We just like Becker. Um, but in most firms, like I said, our size are larger, they will pay for that. Then they'll obviously pay for a bonus, like you said, if you complete it. We have had candidates. This year, we had a lot of candidates that were one or two pieces. The time before that, I think we hired 15, and eight of them had already completed the exam. So, that was a year that we were like, wow, they're ahead of the game. But um, which is nice for us because they can get out, start working on the job immediately. We're not having to worry about that schedule. Yeah. But you'll get it done. I mean, if that's what you want to do, you'll find time to study. <coughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So, so let me tell you about a few advantages. Again, I don't want to go over time. Some advantages, Small and Jenkins. 
When you think of public accounting, what's the first thing you think of? Schedule? You've heard the long hours and taxes. Yes. yes. <laughs> there are long hours, but they're not the crazy hours. You're not going to have 80 hours. You're going to have probably 50 to 60. Yeah, I, probably the most I'll work in a week is 60. And that's just part of it. Yeah. I feel like you are getting paid like well. February 1st through March 31st. I, I might work 60 a week, a couple of weeks. Yeah. And then other than that, we try to add flex schedules. So we're a 40 hour work week firm, meaning that if you get 40 hours in, today I work, I will total work about 12 hours. So I'm not working on Friday. So that's kind of how we work. If you get in your hours, you do a good job, you can go home and just not worry about the rest of the week, which is really nice, unless it is busy season. Yeah. That goes in, you just will have to work those long hours during that time. And that's really at any firm, everyone you talk to, they work those long hours. My husband works at another public accounting firm and he worked the 80 hour work week. He's, um, I mean, that's just part of the profession. Let's see, we offer parenting leave. If for ones that have children, like I do, or want to have children one day, we do offer leave, um, man or woman, for, for during that time of life, which is very exciting and stressful, tiring. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's see, what's some other parts of ours? We have very good benefits. Yeah, very good benefits. Again, CPA exam, jeans, Fridays. Yeah. It's going to go to full time. The whole industry is moving that way. Mm -hmm. A lot of firms are already doing full time. Where did you? Get I work? worked at uh, Landing and Associates okay. out of Thomasville and Tallahassee. And like you said, um, during tax season, sometimes they do half day Saturdays. Mm -hmm. And so during the summer, they do half day Fridays. Mm -hmm. um, and then like Fridays are jeans, casual, laid back type deal. I mean, polos, but yeah. So we are Fridays, jeans, Thursdays, if you pay $5 towards a good service, or Habitat for Humanity, whoever it might be, we pick that during that time to wear jeans. I will say a lot of large firms will, let's talk about small jeans. You should let all of you know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Craft, I mean, we could go on HLB, they've all moved to all jeans, so I think we'll be right behind They call them. it dress for the day. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you know you're going to be in the office and you're not seeing clients, then you can dress down. But if you're in the, either in the office and seeing clients or out of the office, then you can't just show up in jeans and a polo. And I think they moved all this way because of recruits. They feel like that's what y'all want to wear is jeans, which I find the opposite. Everyone's excited to finally wear those clothes the parents keep buying up for Christmas. But, <laughs> it, um, but anyway, it is nice because it does kind of get tiring wearing these kind of things all day long. So it's a nice little perk. We do a lot of community service events. Every quarter we have a big event where the whole office will get together and do something. A lot of times you invite your families. That's the way to get back. I think this past year we gave 70,000 back to the community, which is pretty nice. And that's just from a community service event. Forget all the other nonprofits that we do support because they're our clients. So, what else? Um, what do you think? Um, do I have any questions? Any other questions? Oh, I will say, I know I kind of hit on the whole what our other firms are doing and the other schools we visit. Be proactive. I mean, you're the one that needs the job. You're going to reach out to us. I know as a recruiter, I try my best. I haven't been the best at it, but um, I try my best to respond to everybody to get people into the office when they ask to get into the office. The reality is we're just visiting so many schools. There's so many applicants, and it is really hard. And we're dealing with all the CPAs that um, have very busy schedules. So to try to fit it all in can be a lot. But um, just be proactive. Like again, it is your job. All the offices typically, meaning Malden and Jenkins and other firms will allow you to do an office visit. That doesn't it's not for HR considered an interview. So if you're interested in a firm or a location you want to, just call them and ask them, can I stop by for 15 minutes? Can I come by? It will turn into much more than that. They're really interviewing you, but it's it's off the record, which is kind of nice for us because we can get to know you. It's not a formal interview with a firm representative. So, you know, and that way you can see our office space and I guess decide if you think that firm is right fit for you. And you'll meet a lot of staff along that visit. They might take you out to lunch, whatever it might be. So I would reach out firms and just ask them, can I come by? What event are you going to be at? <clears throat> and career services can help. They're a very good resource. We work with them. College to Gates. I was going to real quick. Gates is Georgia Association of Colleges and Employers. 
they have a big career fair every year that they invite Georgia Tech listeners to participate in. And um, that's actually how I found my job, which is crazy enough. But um, that is a really good resource. If y'all have an opportunity, go to that. And you'll, there's probably 50 companies there. There will be some public accounting firms. They'll typically be industry. But um, it's just a good way to get in the process of going through from booth to booth and selling yourself in five minutes. Like yes, that's something. That's something that, uh, <laughs> that if you're doing that, that, everybody needs to work on. And I'm sure, hopefully, you cover that in your um, what is it, business speech, or I'm sure there's a class or something. Business, communication. business communications. Yes, I'm sure you cover it in that. But it, you really got to learn how to sell yourself in that five minutes. My only or final question was, you know, you mentioned as the workload and everything that you have to endure uh, as a recruiter. What what type of follow up schedule would you recommend so that you're not overly burdened, but you know you're you're keeping them? Uh, it's hard. It's important what office it's for. We have a lot more availability in our Atlanta office than we do some of our smaller offices. So it's just kind of if I tell you I'm going to get back to you in a few months. Reality is I'll have met a lot of people between now and then, so I would keep up with them. But um. There's no need to be our friends on social media. There, that's not going to really help. There's just, just a quick email, resume. This is what I'm looking for. Always say on your resume at the very top it says objective. Everyone's nice. Everyone's got good grades. Everyone's working hard. <laughs> I would put any of that at the top. I always just put up my objective is to find a spring internship 2017 in the Atlanta area or with a public accounting firm. I'm a CPA candidate. I mean, whatever it might be, just quick to the point. <clears throat> always put that in there because that's the first thing we see. We don't like trying to figure it out because, again, there's just so many applicants. Yeah, and that, that's what I'm getting. You know, there's a there's that awkward relationship between the the applicant and you know the the HR department. You know, we don't want to hound you where like oh, this guy was just really getting on my nerves. You know, so all right, yeah, that's gone. So. Yeah, and I mean, you just have to find that balance. I will say that th we go over generational differences all the time. The people that own the firms, that are the typically the managing partners or the partners of the firm, are typically white-haired males. It's just the truth. Whether or females or whoever it might be, so they're of that generation that are hard workers. Their parents were typically in the military, or their grandparents, or they might have served during you know, a certain war. So they're very dedicated. They're there at seven o'clock and they're probably gonna stay to six if not later and they expect you to be there and they want you to dress nice. So just be mindful of that when you're going through the recruiting process that they are our bosses and one day we will get more flex and we'll you know, dress down and all that. But right now they are our bosses and there's nothing, the way, there's nothing wrong with the way they think, there's nothing wrong with the way we think. I still consider myself a millennial. <laughs> but. Um, and it, just be mindful of that, that, you know, they do expect you, yes, it, it wasn't Atlanta traffic, so we'll say our, our office hours are really between 9 and 4. If you want to get there at 7 and leave at 4, that's great. If you want to get there at 10 and leave at 6, that's fine. But um, they're going to be there between 8 and 5 every single day. So just be mindful of that, that, you know, if you're looking for an easy job, probably public accounting is not it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> but it is very rewarding. If you're somebody that likes a challenge and like to do something new a lot, um, and like a one career that's gonna keep you on your toes, then it's very rewarding in that aspect. And it can be very financially rewarding. Absolutely. And at our size firm, if you want to be a partner, it really truly is a possibility. I know some of the larger firms it might not be um, or you don't necessarily want to start your own firm, you don't want to recreate the wheel, I think our SUS firm is a good one to join because you yeah. do have those possibilities. Or if you will, I mean, I work Monday through Thursday, so when I said I won't work on Friday, I didn't tell y'all that I don't work on Friday. But, um, but I might roll it over to the next week. But that's just my schedule. I did, um, I went to that schedule after we had a child. So, um, so that's nice too that you really can, as life, we have several less than full time employees. In audit and tax. She can do it in an attorney. So that's a nice opportunity to work with you. Anything else?
thank y'all for having us. Yeah, and y'all do, do consider us. I hope we didn't scare y'all, but we are a great <laughs> part. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Okay, really.